Leah Crywack from Manchester, England. Uh, we're here at Alibi Studios. That song is called Unassimilated Normie, uh, and this next track is called Cry One Composers. <laughs>
This next song is called A Phony in a World of Holden Caulfields. I might have a capo in wrong place then, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I just played it a bit wrong, have to be honest. I think that's where we're at right now. New version. New version, yeah. The wrong version. <laughs> Let's see how wrong we can get this one for you. This song's called Life is Life, and that's so deep. Same. I have to like watch what you're playing while you're well doing it. How's it going, guys? Hey, how, how are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks so much for coming in. I have to say straight up, because I know you have a busy schedule while you're here. Oh, well, we're very happy to, to be here yes. and to yeah. have a busy schedule because of you as well. <laughs> oh, it really means the world to us here. So, um, so yeah, Crywank on Alibi Lounge, um, or Alibi Studios. Oh, did I say <laughs> studios? I knew I'd get it wrong. No, it's all good. It's all good. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Crywank, how's your visit to Dublin been so far? Yeah, it's been good. Uh, very expensive on the transport, mm-hmm. if I'm going to be yeah. honest. Preach it. I, uh, I, but I mean, everywhere I go, I tend to rant about that. Apart from in Eastern Europe, transport there's great. Oh, um, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, did, uh, we came here two days ago, and then we've come back again. Yeah, we, we had like a big uh, back and forth to Clonakilty for the guitar festival. Oh, yeah, how was that? Amazing. Yeah? yeah? Really enjoyed it. Very daunting, because... Uh, I've nearly everyone in the whole town seemed to be a virtuosic uh, musician. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh man, honestly, you're kind of like stunning us in there. And the oh. same with the drums, like it's it's mental, like what you're doing. So oh, thank, oh, thank you. you. Got a clone of Kilty, they'll blow you away even more. <laughs> trust me. <laughs> May go down there. Um, so yeah, ten years of Cryo, is that right? Yeah, ten whole years. That's amazing. Congratulations. Thank at least. you. Um, have you been signed for any of that? No. Um, never been signed, so complete DIY. Never been thing. signed. We've, we've had, like, uh, help from certain areas. So we had, like, a, 
a, a, a distribution thing for one album where mm -hmm. they pressed like a thousand records and we've had like um, DIY labels like uh, Mount Seldom, which is a tape label. It no longer runs. Uh, uh, the person, Mikhail, who ran it, uh, he, d he passed recently, um, but he re-released a lot of what we had on tape. Uh, yeah. Because me and Dan are always traveling, so it's um, we don't have a web store. We can't send stuff from yeah, 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 yeah. when we're away, and we don't yeah, really have anyone doing it for us. Mm -hmm. so. And we're pretty bad capitalists and don't have much <laughs> interest in making money. And <laughs> it, it, it does, uh, if I was going to see, in a, see a band and they were like, uh, you can't buy a record, everything's online, I'd be pissed off. But it yeah, seems to yeah, be yeah, something yeah. that we've maintained for quite a long time. Oh, yeah, and it seems to be working too. So. Yeah, people get annoyed. We don't have T-shirts, we don't have records, but we sometimes have pin badges or download codes or Dan will just sell drawings. Yeah, <laughs> just the little things, eh? Yeah, we just, we're just not uh, the most money-focused. We like having enough to do stuff mm -hmm. and to get about, but, you know, we like doing... Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think it's the way to be, just kind of focus on the music rather than yeah. on the business side of things. Um, yeah, so 10 years, like, that's, that's crazy. Um, and you've been completely DIY. What's, like, what's changed in regards to being DIY since when you started to now? I mean, we, I, I actually don't, um, we're a self-managed band, mm -hmm. but I don't like using the term DIY because uh, we have so much privilege within the, the scene. Okay. And um, it's definitely changed as, uh, as a <coughs> term. It's now, it's now something that music magazines uh, try and sell people as a genre rather than just an approach to to music where yeah, yeah, yeah. whereas like when we kind of started DIY kind of had its had its roots in what probably happened in America in like the 90s and stuff like that oh yeah there's a lot of DIY comes from like the screamo scene the oogly folk punk crust punk scene the noise scene mm -hmm. um, and over the years I found things like NME or Kerrang suddenly reporting on DIY yeah but it's less about you know the political idea of doing it yourself mm -hmm. it's more about uh, it being socially conscious pop punk even if the band being described as DIY is on a label and has a booking agent yeah yeah we do have one booking agent um, in Australia which is why we don't use the term DIY even though we've only toured Australia once before and yeah, yeah, yeah we book nearly all the shows we do but um, I don't really like using the term as much anymore because it's it's a term that should empower people at the bottom. Mm -hmm. And we have thousands of plays on the internet. Um, <laughs> Millions. <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't need that empowerment. We'd rather those terms be used to empower the people who are starting out, releasing yeah. music themselves, who don't have those support networks. Yeah. And one thing that really frustrates me as someone who's kind of had the self-managed DIY ethos going along mm -hmm. is when I see people on labels with managers, booking agents, all this stuff, using the term that's yeah. like appropriating something that comes from the bottom to yeah, promote yeah, yeah. yourself and makes yeah. me feel icky <laughs> as hell really icky but that is where you came from though right yeah it's, it's, it's the yeah. scene we, we so you've been there you it, know. it means a lot like to us uh we just because it means a lot to us we feel weird keeping that term attached to us yeah, yeah. um yeah <laughs> yeah and you started out solo yeah it was solo for two years although me and dan would jam during those periods of time uh, the second album, album art, was done by Dan. Mm -hmm. um, and Dan joining the band was like a very natural transition. We don't even have like a specific day where it's like, this was when Dan joined. It just yeah, 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 it yeah. just happened very naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, but Dan, about eight years ago, would you say? Uh, I'm really bad with... Uh, was it not... Yeah, it must be eight years ago rather than six. Uh, 2012. I don't know what you were in that. 2019. Seven. 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 And seven. seven and a bit. <laughs> seven and seven. And a bit. <laughs> I must say the, the acoustic guitar with the drum kit, uh, like it's a really interesting dynamic. Oh, and yeah. like, it's not something you see that often either, like, you know, but it really works, I must say. Yeah, we like kind of um, like, you know, silly catchphrases we make up, but no pedals, no masters, I yeah. guess, is <laughs> the, uh, the idea. Uh, a lot of folk punk, uh, or what people say is folk punk, kind of, uh, it, it can sometimes follow structures of it being like, the same strumming pattern and the choruses are whoa, yeah, yeah, whoa. yeah. <laughs> and uh, I think what one thing that I really like about Dan's drumming and where we're moving forward writing with our newest stuff is trying to take elements from other genres and just see how that translates through um, not having any effects on the guitar, just one acoustic guitar, yeah, and Dan just going for it on the drums and not holding back, regardless of the fact that we don't have all these heavy pedals and yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's a really like um, intimate setup if you get me, and it's like it's like really delicate. Even though it's so like like trashy almost, it's so like delicate. And even look at the kit; like there's things everywhere, and it's but it really works. Like you know, 
I relate mm -hmm. a lot to delicate and trashy. <laughs> I really <laughs> like that description. <laughs> delicate and trashy, you can keep that. <laughs> um, yeah, so obviously 10 years must have been a lot of highs and lows between mm. that. And like, is there anything worth sharing that way? Like, what's been the highest point of the last 10 years? Um, oh, crikey, the <laughs> highest point. The first, t first tour we did in Australia was mind-blowing. Um... I'm trying to think. I've, I've been Can very, I push very on the spot, lucky. Yeah, yeah I've I had think, a lot of... Uh, I think we're in a... a <coughs> it, we keep having, like, repeated uh, instances of, of things that are kind of, like, make us feel good about what we're doing, which is, like, we're pretty fortunate to play in, like, really black, uh, faceless venues that, that cram in a lot of people, and it is, like, completely music industry mm -hmm. kind of stuff, but we much prefer playing in, I suppose, like, anarchist and, like, social spaces that... Yeah, yeah. ...that... Um, Sometimes we're like, it's really good that like maybe like a 16 year old will put on their first gig in a space like that and bring up a load of new people into a, a space in their town that they weren't aware mm -hmm. existed. And those, those kind of things are more like, I prefer doing stuff like, I see as a bit more monumental than kind of like yeah, I think achieving the plays or. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the the like pair of us really enjoy just doing those things like more community based things and yeah. also getting younger people involved within the scene. Mm -hmm. Like we'll have it if a, if a teenager messages me like an 18 year old and they're like, Oh, uh, will you play my town? I'll, if I don't have contacts, I'll be like, here's how you put on a gig. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. If you want to put us on, here's how you do it. We, we don't, we won't have a guarantee, but we're happy. We just want 70% of the door. If you want to make it donation entry, that's fine. Yeah. Just have a look at community centers and who can maybe host us. Mm -hmm. uh, but sometimes, especially with traveling far, we'll try and do it where if the only show we can get is like a more, like uh, Dan said before, the kind of faceless black box rooms that yeah, are just yeah, yeah, selling yeah. stuff in a bar, we'll try and use that show and the, the profits of that to help cover the transport to then also mean that we can do a show that's like a name your price DIY show in a poorer area. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. nearly all the moments we have that are the most humbling, uh, the ones where we go into these spaces, which very often it's like you're in a weird, janky film. Yeah, that yeah, like, I get you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's like a dream sometimes. Those, those spaces are, yeah, mean I a think lot more than... Even the audience, I think, I know I myself would much prefer to go to a gig like that, because again, it's, it's a lot more intimate and trashy <laughs> if you want to. but um like rather than going to like you said just a dead face black box kind of venue but yeah um um what about the lows then don't no. want to take it down here hey, but <laughs> be, being hungry and not having anywhere to live is yeah, defi yeah, yeah definitely a permanent uh structure within within my life since joining the button yeah i <laughs> i'm uh, quite lucky that i managed to move into a, a flat recently Oh wow. uh, well, it's, it's like a house, but it is, I am subletting a room which is just a mattress on a floor, which is about a fifth of the size of this room. Um, the mattress takes up most of the room. <laughs> um, but me and Dan have spent a long time with this band, uh, not living anywhere, um, just couch surfing, yeah. doing tours. Just giving everything to the music yeah. rather uh, than... Sometimes the situations where... Uh, it's even happened once in Dublin, I think, <laughs> where we, we fuck up, we, we d don't manage to get uh, accommodation or yeah. things along those lines, and we end up not eating for too long. We end up staying up all night on a bench because we've got nowhere to sleep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, stuff like that is the hardest <laughs> and lowest points. And but again, even so. within those moments, you'll sometimes find, like... Inspiration. Yeah, or something interesting, something yeah. something fun can happen, but obviously the worst bit is just the effect it can have on your physical health, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, like, I would imagine you do get like a lot of inspiration from those kind of moments, would you say? Uh, I don't know. I, I try and consciously... I mean, sometimes it falls in. I have a lot of lyrics about being in the band, mm -hmm. but I try not to let them... Well, Dan actually stops me, pretty much. Uh, I write nearly all the lyrics, but mm -hmm. everything gets filtered through Dan. Yeah. And every so often, Dan will be like, no one's going to relate to this. This is about <laughs> being, like, not living anywhere and touring in a band. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe We're in a very privileged position. We, sh we shouldn't have the... We shouldn't be given... Uh, the amount of time to complain about it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's like we, we should we should complain about things that maybe other people can relate with, rather than being like, ah, oh, being in a cool band and traveling the world is is does have a downside. It's really bad. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. That that won't fit with the tone of what yeah. we're trying to do. But I will write stuff like that impulsively because that's my experience. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, as well, we noticed kind of before you came that you get a lot of fan art and you're part of a lot of memes as well, we've noticed. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I, I think it just comes from being, um, like self-managed, mm -hmm. um, 
And I, I guess when you don't force yourself out there through PR and promotion, uh, I think like meme culture has like a lot of anti-capitalist layers within it. Yeah. And people acknowledge that and you end up with when people get into it, kind of spreading it in that way. And we encourage it as well. You know? Oh, so yeah, of course. If someone makes a meme, I'm going to share your meme. Yeah. If someone does <laughs> yeah. some fan art, I want to share your fan art. It's one of the most humbling things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we, we're so lucky with the fact that most of our promotion has just come from fan art and memes. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's funny. It's kind of like you've developed kind of this little community around you. Not little by any means. It's <laughs> a huge community, but it's it's really nice kind of closed community is what it seems like, you know. So, um, Dan, you're the artist here. Um, what's your favorite fan art? Is have ever gotten what uh, that we got? Um, I don't. I don't o- often. Uh, I'm not uh, always privy to see the mass hordes of uh, of like furry stuff that uh, James gets sent. Yeah, I, I, get, I get a lot sent to me. We've had like oh yeah, uh, loads of like portraiture that um, kind of like if you put them all in like an animation and had like a, a split scene, your face would look like it was like going into some like mutated kind of like Picasso <laughs> thing. I don't. I don't. I don't really know. It's just like really humbling to kind of like think that something that you've made impacts on somebody to get them to make something. Oh yeah. You know, like it, it's and it's a, a very like rewarding experience to see how other people digest something that you think is like completely a directed message, but people can take it in a completely yeah, different uh, way. It. Yeah. You know, it's 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 interesting to see all the fan art and memes, obviously, but. No, the fan art is an interesting one. Um, obviously, over the last 10 years, you've built a huge discography, and it's absolutely huge. What's You surely have like a favorite album or favorite single or something from the last 10 years. Like, I What's your favorite thing? I think me and Dan would probably unanimously agree that Egg on Face is the best thing we've done. Okay. But that is uh, largely for our taste. Um, we wrote that a lot more maybe for us than for like a conscious audience as much. Yeah. Um, but I think the most important thing we've done is the Tomorrow is Nearly Yesterday album. And mm-hmm. there's like a lot of uh, kind of like energy that comes from entering like young adulthood and being confused about it, okay. which the older I get, I'm never going to be able to recapture that. Yeah, I'm yeah, just going to yeah. try and find what else I can capture. But I think that's the most important thing we've done. But for my personal taste, Egg on Face is the <laughs> one. That's the most fun. What year did that come out, do you know? Pardon? What year did that come Egg out? Egg on Face was 2017, but we okay. released it specifically just to be contentious and bad at promotion fools uh, after all the album of the year lists came out. I think oh, okay. we, did we release it on the 29th of December or the 21st of December or something? It was some day <laughs> like New Year's Day or Christmas Day or something. It was it was <laughs> one of the worst days to release an album in the whole year cycle. <laughs> no. It's like when everybody's probably like comatose from eating too much or pissed. <laughs> did you ever find when... um? Tomorrow's nearly yesterday came out and I started building and growing. Did you ever find yourself kind of losing touch of what you originally set out to do? Or were you always kind of aware, like with that album that you put out, kind of brought you back down and on purpose kind of made it a promotion disaster? <laughs> I don't even really know. Uh, I mean, it, it, I don't know how consistent Crywank is as a band with, with, with what we're trying to do. Uh, I think there's overarching things. I mostly sing about myself. I mostly sing about depression. Mm -hmm. And like there's certain themes that always reoccur, like um, trying to reconcile a kind of um, first world kind of privilege with being depression, like being depressed. Yeah. Being depression, fucking hell. (laughs) Uh, And, you know, trying to have it where it's like you can acknowledge all these things you have in your life, um, but also have these mental health issues. And very often those things can spiral into mm-hmm. like a ball where it's like, oh, I hate myself even more yeah. because I hate myself and I shouldn't. And then, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, it builds and builds. So I guess that's like a recurrent theme. But I think the goals from where Crywank started to what they are now have maybe changed to a degree. Okay. And just your, your latest album that came out this year, Where in Beige on a Grey Day, is that kind of based around the same kind of themes or...? Has that changed as well? I think I'm trying to do uh, like m- broader themes. Okay. So like uh, Beige on a Grey Day has like a lot of like, maybe not really overt, but um, songs about gender within it, um, songs about uh, eating and um, well, eating, sleeping. Um, uh, I, it's less about, I, I think the earlier music is more about uh, the way my brain works and the, mm-hmm. the way the thoughts go. Yeah. And a lot of the songs are about like, recurrent thought processes yeah yeah whereas i think the the new stuff is maybe trying to either have like a broader 
kind of thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And have something which someone can maybe unpack a bit more. Mm-hmm. But on the adverse effect, I can't really even give a rule being like, this album is this, because yeah. there's some tracks on that album that me and Dan wrote purely for fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, it, it kind of fluctuates. Egg okay. on Face is, like, another example of that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's cool, though. It's cool to see what you're doing. Um, obviously, you were in Workman's Day playing an all-ages show. Mm-hmm. How was that? Oh, I really, really liked it. Yeah? yeah the, the crowd was super nice. I liked doing, uh, like, an occasional strip-back kind mm-hmm. of show. Yeah, it was cute. Did Although you stay in Watch, Dan? No, no. Um, <laughs> my, uh, I forgot that my friend just moved back to Ireland, so uh, she came up. Oh, I came over and I just uh, sat downstairs getting pissed. Oh, right, cool. I, cool. Could I, hear, I, c- <laughs> I could hear James shouting from upstairs, but I'm around that quite a lot. Yeah, so. Dan watching a solo set from me, I imagine, is is not the most. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like. <laughs> just fidgeting. Yeah, he's, he's had to watch me play way too many times. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, you're playing again tonight. By the time this goes out, that's going to be over. So. Um, what else have you got coming up? I see you're touring Australia again mm-hmm. soon. When's that? Uh, so uh, we are going to Australia in about three weeks. Okay. Doing Australia, New Zealand, and then going around Southeast Asia. Oh, cool. And I've got a short solo tour in Sweden as well in oh, well, two weeks. I, ke- I keep booking stuff very last minute. <laughs> it's just how the band operates, I guess. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, it, sounds like, it sounds like good fun, though, you know. Um, yeah, so I wish you the berry vet. The berry vest of love. The very best of luck with everything coming up. What's the next song called? Uh, the next Do you song know? <laughs> is called "That All Is Aching." Okay. We'll cool. That. Well, you just take it away and run it on out. Cool. Thank All you right, so much. Guys. What are we doing after that? Uh, we'll we'll cross okay. that bridge when we get there. <laughs> of happiness is completely based on fiction accustomed to disappointment from the human condition 
condition I've been fed exaggerated emotions And I've taken them as wisdom Romance has torn me a new Broke a stick, dandy. So and you, while you were filming, you were like, oh, I don't know whether you got it. And so like, he, he cleaned up. I don't think he was nervous this time. I'm more like, oh, what do you say? Oh, I might as well not even fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not like that people now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like this. Not, not like I'm like that. <laughs> Okay, this next song's a love song.
We have uh, one more song for you all. Uh, Uh, this song is about someone trying to write an essay about the popular doll Barbie. Dan just pulled a face being like, why the fuck are we doing that one? <laughs> this song's called An Academic's Lament on Barbie. <laughs> Or is this sober analysis of plastic? A fanatic, frantically forged 5,000 words on the relevance and development of marketing to girls and the harshness of the world against all odds she worked. A hundred and thirty jobs, but still thrilled mostly by the presence of hard rock, unaffected by patriarchy or recessions. Soon it must be questioned. The dull face only represent what first is projected. Grammar and spell check. How did mold the plastic? Keep reading the dramatic, but pause is over romantic. Maybe Barbie would rather be a gnarly, dirty, happy toast, drawn up with a sharpie, kissing girls at a party. A thing you want to see as pristine whilst preserved in a box. Most Barbies end up naked and limbless with their hair shaved off. Perhaps it should be mentioned the Barbie would be sectioned, having weigh ins every day. But what others call perfection, you can say she's just a doll. What does her size really mean? Party Barbie, still when folks say you don't need Perhaps an ever-changing icon reflecting female progress Perhaps a shallow feminism focused on individual success Thank you, we've been Crywank. Thanks. 